project that we're going to um, talk about today um, is our PRISMS Informatics Center grant. And basically, it looks at an infrastructure for pediatric asthma. PRISMS is a new trans NIH initiative. It's pediatric research using integrated sensor monitoring systems. It's a whole program. It included a data coordinating center, two informatics centers, and about seven um, sensor development centers. Um, it is administered through NIBIB, but it's funded through uh, about a half a dozen of the NIH um, institutes. And uh, Dr. Facelli and I are co-PIs on this project. But it's not just the two of us. There is a huge team, and this um, team uh, this is only a few of the faculty involved in it to give you a sense of the different departments that are involved in this project. So we have a core of us from BMI and the College of Nursing, um, and uh, Julio and Ram also work with the Center for Clinical and Translational Science. We have a core group of people from the Department of Pediatrics. And then we have collaborators in electrical and computer engineering. So um, Neil Pat Patwari, the first one on that second row, runs a lab that looks at integrating and networking sensors. Um, Mariah Meyer at the Ski Institute does data visualization. We have experts from chemical engineering and atmospheric sciences that understand how um, the sensor data look and behave. We have some folks from bioengineering who are sensor developers and a number of other experts. So this, this is a large, um, really team science project as well as a data science project. I want to uh, especially acknowledge Ram Gorapetti. Um, I frankly stole a number of these slides from him. Um, so I I'll try to make sure I mention some of the ones that came from him. So a little context. We know globally that air pollution is getting worse and causing a number of health problems, including things like heart disease and asthma. And we know it's a problem here locally in Salt Lake. We have winter inversions. We have high ozone levels in the summer. What this does is it creates some natural experimental conditions locally because we have good air days as well. So we have a nice chance of being able to detect signals from our sensors and to differentiate when these signals are actually caused by pollution. So the CDC um, has sort of taken a look and, and part, of the, part of the influence behind the Precision Medicine Initiative is the recognition that um, medical care and our genetics only make up a small fraction of what actually determines our overall health that our environment and our lifestyle are actually the predominant drivers of overall health states. And so in the context of precision medicine, you've all heard about genomics and proteomics and metabolomics and things of that nature. Well, there's this other omics that we're looking at called the exposo. Um, and in asthma, uh, initially we're going to start looking at air quality, but the exposure and environmental exposures, um, the NIH defines very broadly. So it includes not only the um, physical environment, it includes behavioral factors, socioeconomic factors, psychosocial factors, and the exposome concept looks at that whole interplay in these various contexts. And another tricky component of this is that it, it changes across the life course. So unlike your genome, which is relatively stable, um, this changes on a daily basis. So really, that whole field of exposomics is, is looking at how do we utilize exposome information in biomedical research? There are a number of national efforts that are ongoing um, beyond. So our PRISMS program is only one piece of this big national effort. And, and actually, this big ECHO program, PRISMS will fall underneath the ECHO umbrella. ECHO is looking at. Um, broader beyond asthma effects. So our work will inform the ECHO program and, and collaborate very closely with them. 
This whole thing requires really a systems approach and a systems biology approach. So it really provides a number of interesting opportunities and challenges in biomedical informatics and data science. Well, so what are some of those challenges? One we ran into right away is the idea that there are about um, a bajillion different types of sensors, things we need to look at, and different ways to measure those things. So all different kinds of sensors. It's not a single source of input. And in addition to commercial sensors, there's all these novel sensors being created. So we don't even know what our target is. But we do know that we can link using an Internet of Things approach. So we actually have running in one of our students' homes um, a network of sensors, and it's monitoring lamps in his living room and motion sensors and activity trackers, as well as some air quality sensors. So we know that we can link these together fairly readily. So, so I wanted to focus here on some of the big data, data science implications. And you've probably talked about the, you know, the big Vs of uh, big data, um, variety, velocity, volume, veracity. I'll look at how those play out in the sensor world. And then there's also issues about integration and scalability that are quite important. So looking at just one component of this um, particulate matter, well, it is not a single entity. Um, there's large particles and small particles, and each one has different kind of health implications. So the most common, they look at you know, very, very large particles, things like airborne sand. They look at what they call PM10. That's things that are around the range of dust, pollen, and mold. And then PM2.5 is the real dangerous one. Well, what is measured is actually not even that specific. So some sensors measure PM2.5, PM10. Some only call them small particle, large particle, and say that they're grossly analogous. And then there are some sensors that categorize this in a much more fine-grained way. Suspended particulates, respirable particles, some do ultrafine particles, some separately categorize when it comes from a combustible source as a soot particle. There's a number of different ways to think about what is measured in terms of particulates. And a whole variety of ways to say, how is it measured? So some sensors give us particle counts. Some give us mass. But when they measure mass, it might be in the number of particles per a cubic foot of air. Others do um, micrograms per cubic meter. And then to compound it even more, mass varies with the ambient humidity and temperature. So you have to adjust for that. Then some of the sensors sources only report the air quality index, which is a normalized um, factor that compares the particulate count to the EPA threshold. And then you have to back transform that to get an estimate of the actual particulate mass. It, the back transformation gives you the mass. Um, some sensors report their findings in volts, and you have to convert it from the energy reading to a count, um, and a whole host of other ways that particles are measured. And there are no standards for how this works. But if you transform them, so this um, comes from a commercial website where they took a meter that was measuring in volts, a meter that was measuring in particle counts, and said if you do the right math computations, you can overlay them and see that they actually track relatively um, closely together. So it is possible to combine this information, but it requires a fair amount of manipulation. So. Um, no standards for sensors, huge heterogeneity, a lot of variety in what's measured. These sensors measure, um, they take readings multiple times per second, so high velocity data capture, and then you put them in a location and measure for an extended period of time. So you combine an extended period of time with high velocity, you get high volumes of data. And then the data itself has a huge amount of uncertainty, variability, gaps, it's extremely noisy, and it has additional veracity issues on top of it. So we like to um, remind our researchers that more data is not the same thing as more information. We have to process it correctly. 
So I wanted to, a little bit about veracity. So we did a little experiment. We took 11 sensors that were identical, calibrated together, bought at the same time. These are identical sensors, put them in a rack very closely together. Five of them tracked relatively closely and you can detect events happening in the home. And the other six are like all over the planet. These are identical sensors. We have other data science challenges. We know that exposure is not only what are you exposed to, how much of it, how long, how frequently, but then how your own personal biology reacts to those exposures. From the informatics side, we have to think about things like how do we select the right resources? How do we model for this high spatiotemporal um, area? How do we characterize uncertainty? And then how do we integrate the information so that it's actually usable? So um, we know that, that there's a lot of instability around this, that if you have an exposure and you have clinical symptoms, for the same person, the symptoms can happen either immediately, after a time lag, or they can persist over long durations. So we, we have to intrinsically incorporate pathophysiology and mechanism in our sensor tracking. Um, I think I already touched on this. So um, things that we are looking at, data sources, math modeling, uncertainty, data integration, and then how to present it back out. We know that there are a bunch of different um, sources for our data. And um, just for example, if you're looking at particulate matter, Rom did a survey and this is just a, a sampling of the different kinds of sources he found for censoring particulates. So everything from personal sensors to sensors that are strapped on the back of a pigeon to hot air balloons, um, a number of sources. And we need to try to integrate the data across those sources to create some sort of a picture of the variations in air pollutant concentrations. Compounding that then, and if you think about exposures, is that idea about where are the people in relationship to the particulates. So we have to sort of fill in the gaps in our knowledge with a bunch of different kind of mathematical models. Um, there are a couple of existing mathematical models, but we find that these need to be extended um, and expanded, and we have a, a couple of students working on the mathematical modeling piece. So we have done a little bit of this modeling already. Um, we took data from three monitoring stations in Salt Lake County um, and looked at sort of mapping it out. And then we have a student who has mapped out the population based on the census data and said, here's the biggest concentration of kids versus older people. Um, and then we're working on bringing those together. And um, then we have to sort of, we have various rules for different ways we can look at the different um, data modeling and, and decide whether they're suitable for what we're gonna do. We have another whole effort looking at uncertainty um, and reducible uncertainties, things we can manage, and then just uncertainties around the exposures. Um, and then we have a group thinking about how is this gonna play out in research studies. So there are a couple of uh, high-level use case research types. The one we are beginning with is the, what we actually found to be the easiest, and that is the sensor-centric models, um, where we're looking at things like the difference between interior air quality and exterior air quality. But we know that if we're gonna move into clinical research, we have to think about these more person-centric models and traditional epidemiology research and behavioral research. So we're planning and working our way around those as well. And in fact, when we think about working with people, we do have on our team, Flori Nukoi, who developed this e-asthma tracker and uses that to track symptoms. One of our challenges is that the e-asthma tracker only records symptoms once a week, but we're collecting data on a per minute basis. And then they have a vision of incorporating genomic data and uh, assessments of the homes, allergy exposures, viral loads, and all other kinds of exposures beyond this air quality data, um, and, and thinking about how that plays out in terms of the workflow, both in clinical care and in their clinical research studies. 
One of the interesting challenges that we're coming up with um, in, in that third use case is that idea about behavior and sensing and feedback. When do you provide feedback? How do you provide feedback? Do you do it based on the raw data? Do you provide feedback based on what we've interpreted from the raw data about activities happening in the home? Um, you can imagine, though, a parent getting a message saying, hey, it looks like your kid is being exposed to secondhand smoke. You might want to check out what's happening or make sure he has his um, inhaler with him or whatever. So that's sort of the end goal of these kind of studies. So one way we're doing that is we're collecting information from the home. So we have sensors in the home, and we have a little gateway that collects data across the multiple sensors. That gateway, when the particulate level crosses a certain threshold, can fire a message off to REDCap. REDCap sends a text message to the user in the home that says, what are you doing? I'm seeing a spike in the particles. The family member texts back a response. Um, and then we can pull that data from REDCap into our open further infrastructure. But we have a challenge there about trust. Um, historically, researchers don't actually trust the information that people provide themselves. So how do we use this kind of home feedback um, mechanism with researchers who are intrinsically distrustful? Do we have to flag the data in some way and say this was information provided by the parents rather than um, detected through our sensors. There's even more challenges. Um, but really, the idea of our sensor is to build out an infrastructure to cope with how do we broadly and quantitatively study this exposome when we don't even know what those studies are going to look like. So we have a, a um, nebulous and floating target um, that we're trying to support. So our approach is really to think about how do we efficiently link information together in a modular and flexible manner so that we can support this floating um, nebulous types of future research. And so we're building out on the open further architecture. And um, I'm not going to get into this architecture, but it's an existing uh, infrastructure provided by the BMI core <coughs> in the CCTS program. And, and we have demonstrated on a small scale some of our ability to do some of this linkage. So we linked EPA data with clinical data from the University Hospital and demonstrated our ability to identify different kinds of cohorts. We have experiments happening um, on an ongoing basis. So we have uh, 10 to 12 uh, dialo sensors across a home. And um, then we kick everybody out of the house except one person, and then that person goes in the kitchen and intentionally burns a piece of toast, and we can map out airflow across the home, <coughs> doing some of those kind of tests. We have groups looking at s some of these semantic interoperability issues. The Internet of Things is a hugely flexible platform, um, so flexible that it's almost not standardized, right? So we have to sort of think about how to create semantic interoperability, look at the various choices for um, our ontologies and when would we want to use which ontology. None of these exposure ontologies are really detailed enough to accommodate the raw sensor data. So we have to sort of play the balance game about how do we pick the right ontology, how do we extend it, how do we store the metadata um, across these models and all those issues around data provenance? Um, how do we store information about the uncertainty around a data point? And then what are our sort of the transformative functions we need to cross models and integrate across different kinds of models? So primarily what we're doing is storing things in a very primitive form on a time-based basis. So instead of a person-centric core model, we have a time-centric core model. And then um, people and events and data streams all sort of show up uh, linked by time and location. We have a lot of uh, subgroups working on uh, data integration and workflow and how this is going to fit in the context of a research study um, and, and how we will support different kinds of studies. Um, both in the research environment and in the clinical environment. So what we're going for is this scalable architecture 
well generalizable. We know it's going to be needed beyond air quality and beyond pediatric asthma. That's part of our core charge is to make it extensible. It needs to be able to integrate multi-scale data, multi-omics data, um, genome, phenome, exposome, whatever. Um, we need to accommodate for all of those big data V issues and really try to create a robust pipeline so that we can support these various types of research that are going to be coming down the pipe. So we have a small project um, that basically is built around a common vision and that vision is a transdisciplinary data science center that can integrate and accommodate all these different kinds of studies. That's it. I made their heads explode. Yes? Um, uh, great topic. Just a quick question. Um, this is a great sensor that Apple allows us to um, uh, use. I'm not sure if you can talk about any efforts you or with yourself to use it. Apple has a research kit to help. That is, one of, that is one of the initiatives that we're working on. That particular initiative, we are working in collaboration with the other informatics center. So um, our initial effort to integrate across sensors inside the home, we sort of did a divide and conquer on the two informatics centers because our proposals had almost identical aims and almost identical um, approaches. So we did a divide and conquer and collaborate approach. So we are focusing on a Raspberry Pi device as our integration platform. The California site is integrating on Apple Research Kit as the core integration component, but both projects are using people from both informatics centers. And then they just released a few weeks ago an Android equivalent of the Research Kit. So we're also looking at that. Good question. Yeah. The term exposome yeah. is like is it in your grant? Do you use that term? Yeah. It's like awesome. a known term. Yeah. Okay. I'm curious why you should pick that up. It, it is a known term. It's it's sort of an, an emerging, but there is literature you can cite that defines the term. There is a, rel, a standardized definition. Yeah. Is there a theory that you want or theories you want based on for this project? So the project is um, really in infrastructure based, right? So we're not actually conducting the clinical studies. We're building out the infrastructure. So we are, our sort of perspective is how do we accommodate that systems biology combined with big data needs? So this is based on Just, systems based. It is. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit, Kathy, on how you recommend doing an RM to uh, managing this $5 million? You want the truth on this particular grant? <laughs> <laughs> So I have a long history of collaboration within BMI, a long history of collaboration with the Department of Pediatrics. This particular grant, I actually had been going over to the Department of Peds to talk about a project on the e-asthma tracker. Thinking I was going to come away with an assignment to do um, an updated literature review on stuff relevant to the e-asthma tracker. And um, Flory McCoy, bless his heart, said, what I really need is somebody to PI this other project. I said, are you nuts? I don't know anything about sensors. He said, don't worry about it. The team knows everything they need to know. They just don't know how to write grants. <laughs> That's the honest truth. <laughs> I have come up to speed very quickly, but I've spent a lot of time down in the computer science department. They have a lovely sensor lab in Neil Pakwari's um, area, and, and his postdocs have been so gracious to tear sensors apart, show me how they work, explain it, show me the raw data flows. I've spent a, a lot of time um, actually working on coming up to speed on the particular topic area. But the thing that I particularly bring to this um, in terms of BI, uh, PI, besides being able to actually write halfway decent, is that idea about um, translating. So, so in many ways, it was a benefit for me to come into this not being deeply immersed in exposure data and exposure 
science because um, I could then, they would explain to me what they were doing and I would explain back to them what I understood. And so we were able to um, do this in such a way that we could translate across all those different departments um, that we were working with. So, and that's something as a nurse that, that comes very naturally, that I, you're always translating between you know, the pharmacist and the patient and the doctor and the family. And so that sort of translating behavior comes pretty naturally to nurses anyway. Um, and so that's a lot of what I do here is I serve as the translator across the different groups. I'll do things like putting the um, computer science postdoc in the same room as the physicians and make them talk to each other. <laughs> yeah. Do you program? Yeah, I do. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, 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 understand. I do manage databases and I can do programming and I haven't done clinical nursing for 12 years, so. And even when I did, I was in the ICU, which is pretty tech heavy. Uh -huh. So, since the, big, uh, the data is so big, yeah. and I have a big variety from different sources, so I'm so curious how, how you like integrate them. And so that, um, the short answer is that Ram is going to come and talk for an extensive period of time, right, to this group? Um, we, Ron is going to do a He's going to look at some, series. So right. In our, kind of one of our follow-up courses, a short okay. session on time series, Ron's going to, we're going to but, but, but that's sort of the short answer is that really you have to link them based on um, time and geographic location. And then, because people like move in and out of the exposure areas, people travel around. So you can't really use a person-centered means of linking this stuff, you're going to have to extract it out to say what are the exposures of this person, but in terms of the data storage, we sort of link everything by time and location and then bring the person in and out of those different exposures and extract out then what that person has been exposed to. Yeah. So their person is linked to hundreds of other health conditions. Mm -hmm. How shareable will your data be? The goal is for it, is for it to be um, absolutely shareable across conditions, across uh, time frames. We are upfront linking with Echo and Cheer, which are the broader exposure um, programs. The reason this has a focus on pediatric asthma as the initial use case is very pragmatic. The money for this grant was harvested from the National Children's Study, and one of the priorities in the National Children's Study was pediatric asthma. So in order to get Congress to release the funds, they had to make our initial focus be pediatric asthma. But our charge from the beginning has been that this needs to be applicable across age ranges and across disease conditions. So many of our use cases are, are things like adult um, pulmonary diseases that we use to mop for our modeling. Yeah. I mean, you're going to be in the homes of young families. Mm -hmm. There's infinite research dollars for preventing preterm birth and preterm birth. The yep, patient. there's, a, there's um, some linked side projects coming off of here looking at, at preterm birth, looking at obesity, um, looking at a number of those kinds of projects because the, the challenges are the same, the kind of data we need to collect are the same, and really the only differences are those clinical outcome and symptom pieces, but the raw data, the exposures are pretty much the same. So that's part, part of our charge is to make this um, extendable and generalizable. Yeah? Um, I think this data set is very interesting and, and actually it seems like it is great in a way you are approaching from uh, um, top down. So the environment um, We're actually approaching from both directions. Right, right. That's what I was that's it, yeah. Um, so we have, so we're collecting data from actual sensors right. and doing both a top down right. and bottom yeah. up yeah. Yeah. modeling yeah. effort. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's exactly right. Yeah. Our challenge of course is that the the, the bottom yeah. side, the what sensor do you choose to use to collect right. the data right. changes right. really right. frequently. Right. Yeah. Interesting. So do we have any pigeons in Salt Lake? 
I think those were in London. So when, but we do have sensors on the tracks trains. <laughs> so um, when we went to San Diego, when we signed up for, what was his name? Got a bit, Kevin. He interviewed for the population health. Anyway, so, you know, got all these, you know, things that sensors attached to an uh, Android phone, so you got the GPS. And you just see these big spikes with your pee time. And in San Diego, the, the marine layer comes out in the night and washes it all away and then you can see these spikes. So, the university, I don't think that this winter, last you know, two winters ago, there was a big air quality summit that was very interesting. And just kind of think about some of the things that the big data do for you, I guess. They so on that note, um, we are actually going to do a joint meeting with the Department of Air Quality in September. Here. Here. Okay. Locally. I thought it was so interesting. So one of the things that they just, you know, they, they collect all this air uh, pollution data and they're expecting to see all these pulmonary problems and they f discover all these cardiovascular diseases right. and they think, well, if something's wrong and they start looking at it. And then they, what they realize is that the, is that the nitrous oxide that stops the vasodilation process and the, the, you take a healthy person like, <laughs> Grossly, actually yes, healthy? I'm someone healthy, and, and, and you're exposing them to that error, and their cardiovascular response is as poor as someone with you know, this chronic that your your blood vessels just you know in that air pollution just don't don't, re, don't respond. So they discover this whole other effect that they weren't expecting to see. Well, thanks, Kathy. I guess you sure. can stick around, and people can talk with Kathy. Sure.